12.30, so I thought we would get started. Uh, I'm Diana Lim, I'm the Managing Director of the Pendel Policy Research Initiative. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we're a relatively new initiative here at Penn, uh, created uh, about two years ago now, uh, by, as part of the School of Arts and Sciences Strategic Plan, with the idea of um, kind of taking on one of the aspects of that strategic plan to enhance faculty and student engagement on issues of public policy and social impact. Um, and so as part of that uh, focus, we do a lot of different things, um, one of which is we every year host an annual call for proposals for uh, new research, working groups, conferences, workshops, et cetera, that um, and particularly School of Arts and Sciences faculty um, are interested in the leading that will focus on areas of emerging research that have some sort of policy relevance. Um, in addition to that, we host a lot of the events um, with some um, great speakers who have a policy focus. So uh, next Monday, we'll be uh, having Harry Tregoning, who was uh, part of the Obama administration's HUD uh, sort of top level staff and has worked uh, at all levels of government. She's a really um, wonderful speaker and interesting person. And that's a part of our series called Partners in Policy, where we're having conversations with people who are um, not policymakers themselves, but are influencers. Um, and Harriet was a policymaker, I guess, but um, she's now working on the book and is kind of using her outside of the government role to um, continue that influence. So, um, yeah, feel free to move that stuff over there. Um, so, and we also are doing other fun things, like we're hosting an op-ed workshop with uh, the Washington Post uh, to get faculty who are interested in writing op-ed workshop, uh, op-eds um, to better understand how to place those op-eds. So, these are some of the things we do. In addition, we host this series of graduate student seminars, um, and uh, it's this is our second one of them, and um, it's, a, it's a work in progress, but so far it's been a really interesting and exciting opportunity and a way to understand sort of what some of the emerging areas of research are within the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, and uh, so we're really lucky to, to have Luca um, presenting here today. Um, he'll get started in just a few moments, but I wanted to just give a few words of um, formatting and so on. Um, He's going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have an open discussion for about 30 minutes. We try to keep these um, events to one hour, so we'll have a hard stop at 1.30, and if you want to continue the conversation, feel free to just keep on talking afterwards. Um, if you have a question that's a point of clarification, like you didn't understand something, feel free to ask while he's talking. Otherwise, please hold your questions until the end. Um, and. This is being videotaped, you realize, so just so that you know that. Uh, that's pretty much it. So um, without further ado, Luca Pisando. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so good morning everyone. I usually walk a little bit, Shannon, is that a problem for the video? No, okay, yeah. Um, good morning everyone, I'm happy to be here to share with you some findings from our ongoing research on global family change. Uh, I want to start today by saying that this, is part of a, this paper is part of a collaborative project that involves students and faculty from the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Oxford and Bocconi University, and actually very recently also University of Barcelona, we have here two members. Um, and that this project got recently funded by the National Science Foundation, so our hope is that this is only the first of a series of papers that will deal with this topic. And this also provides sort of the background paper, the motivation behind the whole project itself, because it, I will discuss um, about a lot of broad findings that can potentially lead to other types of research, but this is what we want to convey today, that there is potential for uh, studying global family change. This is part of my dissertation research, um, so I'm the one presenting today, but I'm speaking on behalf of more members, my part of my dissertation committee is here. Um, so what is, the, um, what is the rationale behind looking at global family change? So it's sort of undisputed that families still remain an important fundamental building block of human societies. They shape health, they shape well-being, they shape reproduction. 
Though in recent, um, over the recent decades, I would say at least 50, 50 years, uh, many changes of uh, various nature, demographic, economic and social, have radically shaped and transformed the uh, functions, families, function, roles and, and structures of families worldwide. Uh, I listed here some of these changes, there are many more, but I just wanted to point out here uh, the decline in fertility, the rise in marital fertility, the rise in companionate marriage, by which we mean the type of marriage, uh, that is not necessarily tied to raising kids and is much more based on emotional support between the, between the partners. Uh, then the rising cohabitation, the increasing, uh, the increasing union instability, so more divorce, more union instability in general, and the delay in transition to adulthood markers, by which I mean a, de a delay in the ages at which some of the most critical life events, such as first sexual intercourse, first marriage, and first um, birth happen. So there will be kind of some demographic jargon throughout. I'll try to explain all of them, but if you have questions, please, it's better if you ask them throughout more than at the end. Um, but also, so ultimately, the reason why we're interested in looking at and studying changes in families is that these um, have important implications for child and adult well-being across all development stages. This is sort of more tied to the purpose of this seminar series, given that it's much more focused on policy and impact. Um, I here pointed out that um, th this idea that families shape uh, child and adult well-being has been also echoed very recently in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So I listed here five out of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, those that I thought more, more closely relate to, to changes in families. So we can think about changes in families as having implications for poverty reduction, for uh, human capital accumulation, for different dimensions of children and, uh, and adult well-being, and also having some implications for gender equality within and outside of the household, and in general for different dimensions of inequalities, uh, ranging from health to income to wealth inequality to housing inequalities as well. So also I wanted to be a little more explicit on the link that we trace between looking at changes in family domains and implications for policy or sustainable development goals in general. Let's think about, for instance, um, let's think about early marriage and early childbearing as, as two dimensions in which families might have been changing. First of all, a uh, first interesting question could be to get a sense of whether early marriage and early childbearing have been declining or increasing over the past decades. But once we, once we uh, get a good sense of whether this is happening or not, how do changes in the prevalence of this phenomena relate to, for instance, the goal number four, the one of attaining quality education for all. We could, for instance, think that if uh, early marriage and early childbearing are, are, are declining, this makes it more likely for girls to stay in school longer, so it's more likely for them to be able to sort of eventually complete a whole cycle of education and at the country and, and uh, macro level, this is also sort of something that ties to the, this uh, sustainable development goal number four. Similarly, looking at, a, at another domain that is not uh, early marriage or early childbearing, we could think about, uh, we have we, the world has witnessed increasing educational attainment, especially for women also in low, across low and middle income countries over the past decades. And, and how does this shape the educational composition of the partners that make up the couple? So are, indi are individuals increasingly looking for partners that are more similar to them in terms of observed characteristics such as education, such as income, such as wealth or religion, which is something we call in the literature assortative mating. So is this something that is going on? Are we observing individuals to mate assortatively more and more? And if this is the case, what does this imply for gender equality within the household. Would we expect uh, a couple in which two individuals have a more similar mm. educational attainment to be also more balanced in terms of decision-making power in other dimensions, such as who makes decisions, the husband of the wife or the wife, in areas as varied as uh, reproductive health, household purchases. So this is sort of the idea, to look at changes in family domains and eventually, well, not necessarily today, but as part of the project itself, try to get a sense of how this shapes uh, these other dimensions of social and policy impact. So, uh, the main rationale behind this project, so we started thinking about this project based on a, on a review of the literature, through which we noticed that there is very little research on, on macro-level trends in global family change in general. This is all the more the case in uh, low and middle income countries. So the scant research that we have mostly focuses on high income countries. For low and middle income countries, the comparative uh, nature of this work uh, 
is not really out there yet. And this has to do with many, uh, with many reasons. The first one is that it's in general hard to conceptualize family change across different dimensions and across different types of countries. And also, much more practically, it has to do with the difficulty of having uh, good, high quality comparative data that would make it possible to assess trends in uh, family domains across countries. So the data component, it actually, it's actually a, a very important one for our project. We are investing a lot on uh, integrating, find, first of all, finding data sources that make it possible to compute these indicators in a comparative way. Once we find the source, we also invest a lot of time in harmonizing the data to, to compute the indicators. So this has been, for sure, uh, a big effort on our part. And this is how we started this project that then eventually moved more to the theoretical side. Um, however, given that most of the transformations that have been occurring in uh, high-income countries over the past at least 50, 80 years are now entering their height in low- and middle-income countries. So it's becoming more and more important to get a sense of, of what's going on in low- and middle-income countries. And, and there is, of course, some research. There is some literature also in low- and middle-income countries. It's not much, but most of it from our reading of the literature, focuses on changes in fertility. So there is sort of this idea in the, liter in socio in the demographic and sociological literature that changes in fertility and changes in families are closely tied, that family formation still remains a precondition for, for, uh, for, for fertility. So what we want to uh, assess here in this, in this paper is to look at different dimensions, dimensions other than fertility. Of course, looking at fertility because, because this is a, a key one, but also move beyond fertility and get a sense of changes across all, a whole other series of domains. Um, so the specific goals of these papers are, it's mostly the first one, it's very closely tied to the second, but we're going to mostly address the first one today, is to provide a, a macro level overview on the changing nature of families at primary and adult ages across 84 low and middle income countries. So this was the highest number of countries we could, we could cover given the data source that we are using. Also, it's important, um, I highlighted here the primary and adult age because this is, a, this is an important clarification. We specifically focus on ages 15 to 49. This is, again, due to two reasons. One that is more theoretical. Most of the theorizations that have been made or have been done in the area of family change relate to adult ages. And also because the data that we use sample individuals from ages 15 to 50, 15 to 49. So this is really the chunk of ages that we're looking at. Uh, however, in our project, in our proposal, in the project itself, we have acknowledged that most of changes are happening as well at old ages. It's just that we're going to focus on changes uh, at old ages in, in a different paper. And this is really the main question of the paper. So how have families changed with advances in development over the past 30 years? And now I will explain what I mean by advances in development and how we measure advances in development here. And the second goal that I said is not really tied to today's presentation, but it's something we have in the background, is to provide evidence of whether there is some cross-country convergence in family indicators. So, for instance, do we see that countries are becoming, over time, more and more similar in terms of their cohabitation practice, or do we instead observe that countries over time diverge more and more in terms of their cohabitation prevalence or cohabitation practices? And this can be done not just for cohabitation, it's just an example. It could be done on many, many different other um, domains. Um, so, our, our project and the paper itself engages with uh, some theoretical perspective. The first one, so there has been some um, theorizing has been done on global family change and it actually dates back to 1963 with uh, this famous book by Goods that was titled World Revolution and Family Patterns. And in, and in this book, uh, Goods postulates that with uh, industrialization, so with advances in development, we would observe a global convergence towards the conjugal family form, which is, uh, which is the nuclear type of family uh, that includes like, parents and children, very little intergenerational co-residence. Um, also closely tied to this convergence idea, this global convergence idea that was advanced very early in 1963. More recently, around 1986, um, Two scholars advanced this uh, idea of the second demographic transition, which postulates that instead that uh, we will move, countries will move gradually towards a regime of low fertility, later and less marriage, so a postponement of marriage. And uh, very importantly, also a, an increasing disconnection between marriage and procreation. So we increasingly observe uh, out of wedlock childbearing. 
And all of this unfolds along with advances in, um, in women's bargaining power, so increase, increases in women's independence measured in many ways. Um, but the idea here is that the second demographic transition theory postulates a movement from more material needs to higher order needs that value the self-actualization of individuals, so the importance of pursuing the kind of, uh, the kind of life that you want to pursue, not necessarily tied to the material needs that you want to achieve. And, and these are the changes that uh, unfold along with these shifting values at the macro level. So as you may have noticed, uh, in, both theories, in both theories, inherent is the idea that economic development triggers changes in family forms. So this is important for our paper as well. And this also dates back to almost the foundations of the, the idea of the first demographic transition theory, which, which postulates that with, with a transition from a agricultural and pre-industrial society to industrial societies, populations move from a regime of high fertility and high mortality to a regime of low fertility and low mortality. So this idea of a unidirectional movement towards a regime of low fertility and low mortality that occurs with development, it's something that was embedded in the modernization theory, but it's also something that we engage with here because very broadly speaking our idea is to get a sense of whether the, f the family is moving towards a unidirectional pathway in the same way as fertility and mortality move towards the same pathway 200 years earlier, something along the lines. So we engage with the first demographic transition theory and we make it more complex by looking at different dimensions of family beyond fertility. So the data, as I said before, we pull together um, 286 survey waves and these are, all the, these are the demographic and health surveys that are surveys that sample women from ages 15 to 49 and collect information on reproductive health, uh, family formation, fertility, but very much focused on fertility and reproductive health. And um, so we pull together here all of the available DHS survey waves, which sums up to 286. And the DHS covers most of the low and middle income world. Uh, we classified um, the world into five regions that we call America, so Latin America, Asia, former USSR, uh, Middle East and North Africa, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is mostly based on a review of the literature, this classification. We didn't necessarily follow the United Nations or the World Bank classification. Um, and our DHS survey waves were collected between 1985 to 2015. So this is a 30 year of data, 30 year of data on, on uh, different dimensions of family change pulled together and then we merge this data that provide information on family dimensions and family domains together with data on the human development index. So this is the way in which we measure uh, develop, socioeconomic development. I, I'm sure most of you know what the human development index is but this is a geometric mean uh, computed by the United Nations Development Program that averages three dimensions of well-being. One is uh, standards of living, the other is a health, healthy and long life, and the third one is uh, knowledge and literacy. So it combines these three dimensions and provides a measure of the extent to which a country is developed or, or not. It, it, it ranges from zero to one, so countries that have a higher HDI are more, uh, have a higher human development and, and, and vice versa. And these and data on the Human Development Index were provided by the UNDP, as I mentioned, and these are time series as well. So we were able to merge each country year, because our observation here are country years, we get an estimate of the family dimension in a specific for a specific country in a specific year, and we merge it with the information of a Human Development Index in that specific country in that specific year. And then we also combine some information on standard age distribution and official life tables. These are purely demographic quantities. I will try to explain a little better how we make use of this information. But the underlying idea is that we wanna, we wanna compute some of the more traditional indicators that are available already in the literature and complement this with some somewhat more sophisticated indicators that adjust the ones that are already existing for some uh, potential confounding factors, such as differences in age, age structures across countries, and that's why we get this data, and also differences in 
we want to account for the fact that these low and middle income countries are experiencing increasing life expectancy, so are experiencing declining mortality over this 30 year period. So that's where the, where, that's where the official life tables come from. The official life, table, life tables are the tool that demographers use to get official mortality information. Um, sorry. Uh, this is just to show you that um, in this paper we don't focus on high income countries. This is the density of countries over HDI for high income countries. And the red one is instead the density of countries uh, for low and middle income countries. Instead the green is the, is the density through our sample of data. So this is just to show you that the green line and the red line are sort of overlapping so we're really capturing uh, the dimension we want to capture across all range of low and middle income countries, more or less. So we compute a series of indicators, 18 specifically, I won't uh, describe each of them now, but they will come up again. So 18 indicators across five family domains, fertility, marriage and union formation, sexual intercourse, intergenerational relationships or vertical relationships and intragenerational relationships or horizontal relationships. The point that I want to make from this table here is that, uh, for instance, we compute the total fertility rate, which is the more, most traditional measure of fertility that is available out there, and is the average number of children a woman can expect to have across her lifetime. But we also combine the total fertility rate, which is probably something that you heard about, with the net reproduction rate. There is a measure uh, that demographers compute to account for the fact that not, uh, not all women survive through the end of their reproductive years. So the net reproduction rate takes into account a mortality dimension that the total fertility rate doesn't take into account. So this measures um, surviving children, and the first one measures children ever born in very simple language. Then I can tell you more if, if you're interested. And what does this comparison tell us? This tells us the extent to which uh, mortality trends, specifically declines in infant mortality, matter for the association that we are interested in, so the one between the total fertility rate and the human development index. So if mortality plays a role in this association, is the, if this weakens the association of the, or if this strengthens the association. Um, similarly, for the for marriage, the percentage of women married is a very traditional uh, indicator that is available through many sources online. But we complemented this measure here with one that is called marital expectancy at age 15. And this, imagine a person, a, a child that is 15 years old, and this is the average number of years that that child at 15 can expect to live married, can expect to live in, in, a, in, a, married, in a married union. And the same is for cohabitation, we compute the cohabitation expectancy, the average number of years that an individual who is 15 can expect to live in the cohabitation state, in a cohabiting union. And then we want to compare the percentage of women, women married with the marital expectancy, and the percentage of women cohabiting with a cohabitation expectancy. But this is just to tell you that we, 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 we are trying to compute more traditional indicators and correct them, accounting for some dimensions that have been typically neglected in the literature, such as ages age distributional concerns and differences in mortality. Uh, again, here you see exactly the same 18 indicators, but this is to tell you that the indicators were not chosen at random. They were chosen, first of all, because we could compute them, so we could get an estimate for them comparatively and across countries. And also they sort of comply with this uh, uh, classification of indicators that relates to the, comp to the multi-faced nature of, family, of global family change itself. So we classify indicators in three different typologies. The first, uh, and we call them axes. The first axis we call it family events and behaviors, and this includes some of the more traditional indicators that I already listed, so, such as the total fertility rate, the percentage of women married, the percentage of women living in a cohabiting union. So some of these are more traditional measures that people have looked at, maybe not necessarily in low and middle income countries, but people have looked at changes in these dimensions often. Then uh, the, second, the second axis is the one that we call linked lives, and, we call it, and this is called linked lives uh, following, uh, following the literature. And this takes into account the fact that individuals have relationships both intergenerationally, so with their parents or with their, or with their children, and also horizontally, so for instance within couples, the relationship between partners within a couple. And the third axis of analysis is called life course patterns, and this has a very specific meaning in our, in our work. So with life course patterns, here we mean that 
We combine information on fertility, marriage and cohabitation with mortality information. So we correct the indicators that we included here, accounting for, some, for, for the fact that these countries are experiencing uh, increasing life expectancy in this same period. So for instance, the net, pro net production rate is, the, is compared to the no total fertility rate, marital expectancy is compared to the percentage of women married and cohabitation expectancy and so on. But this is the idea. So this is, in a sense, uh, this is the set of indicators that have been looked at mostly, and these two are instead the ones that we think can tell us more about family change, specifically the third one. So here I just included some descriptive statistics to show you the heterogeneity across regions. This is overall, so for all the low and middle income countries together, and this is for the five regions together. Um, just very quickly, for instance, for the former USSR countries, the total fertility rate over the third year period is 2.28, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, as we know, fertility is much higher, so it's 5.29. Um, something similar holds for this variable here, that is the one that we use to proxy for women's bargaining power within the couple. So this is the percentage of households in which the husband is the sole decision maker about household purchases, about women's reproductive health, and about women's visits to family and friends. So the husband is the sole decision maker for, for these three domains. And you can see, for instance, again, that in former USSR countries, only 12% of ha in only 12% of the households, the husband is the sole decision maker instead of for, for Sub-Saharan Africa as a region for 40% of the households have the husband as the sole decision maker. So this is really just to give you a sense of the heterogeneity across regions. And also we computed here these in timing indicators that we call, so this is called singulate mean age at first sex, you may call it mean age at first sex. We, we compute the mean age at first sex for women and men, the mean age at first marriage for women and men, and the mean age at first birth for women and men. And this is just to show you that while there is, there is not much difference in the mean age of first sex between uh, men and women, they're kind of similar, there are instead very big differences in the mean age of first marriage and in the mean age of first birth, whereby men typically have far higher mean ages at, li at critical life events. So methodologically, um, this paper is pretty simple. We use some sort of linear regression of each family indicator over the human development index. As I said, indicators are computed for each combination of country years. So country years are our units of analysis. We conduct a sort of a global and regional analysis. By global, we mean pulling together all the low and middle income countries and the regional, looking at each region specifically. And importantly, as I was saying before, indicators are age standardized to this 2000 age distribution, which comes from the other source that I listed before. So we account for the fact that countries at different time points have different age distributions. So a country might, may, might have a much older age distribution, such as Italy, for instance, or other countries, especially low and middle income countries, have far younger age distribution. So the bulk, of, the, bulk of, the bulk of people mostly falls in the young ages. And this is important to take into account to purge the indicators from these age distributional concerns. So um, I want to start by showing you these two, these two variables. So this is the total fertility rate which measures uh, children ever born, and this is the mean age of first marriage for women. And what we want to convey with this graph, and, and on the horizontal axis is the human development index, so as the HDI increases, countries are more developed. What we want to convey with these two graphs is that as development advances, we sort of observe a negative association with the total fertility rate. So we observe declining fertility to be associated with higher advances in development. This is a, a very well established finding in the literature, but was it, what, what, what we find interesting is that there is not even much regional heterogeneity. So this is of course Sub-Saharan Africa, which has far higher TFR, and these are most of the other countries. But in general there is a sort of a unidirectional trend towards uh, declining fertility with increases in HDI. And something similar holds for the mean age of first marriage. So what we observe here is that with advances in human development, uh, countries tend to delay mean at first marriage. And this is in line with the one that I called before the second demographic transition theory. So as countries industrialize and advance further, we observe uh, a trend towards less and later marriage, so a postpone postponement of marriage. And this is something we are observing here. So the mean age is increasing as development advances. So these two combined tell us as, as development advances, we observe a trend towards declining fertility and postponement of marriage, in short. Is 
these are mostly due to Africa, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, like, is it like well, we have all of these analyses as well. It's actually going on for Latin America too. No, it's actually going on for most of these regions, I think. These, we don't have Middle Eastern or North African countries. We have very few observations because some of these uh, dimensions were not measured for Middle Eastern and North Africa. But for sure, especially in this data set, Africa is the country that provides us with the most surveys, so it has a huge representation here. But we have all of the analysis by region too, and this is happening across, across all regions. So if we just look at these two graphs, um, the, the message that we get is that, in a sense, the convergence hypothesis predicted by Goods, or this idea of the second demographic transition unfolding in high-income countries and spreading gradually towards low- and middle-income countries, could be happening also in low- and middle-income countries. But let's also look at another dimension here. So this, uh, this measures the percentage of multi-generational households. So the households in which two or plus generations coexist, live together. So households in which more than two generations live together. This, this actually uh, provides a much more blurred picture, as you can tell. There is no unidirectional trend towards declining multi-generational co-residence. It's kind of clear that this is happening in Middle East and North African countries. And instead, we cannot really conclude that this is happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. There is the green, and Latin America, there is the red. But again, this is only to to suggest that there is widespread cross-regional heterogeneity once we move beyond dimensions other than the ones that have been looked at in the literature, specifically fertility, but also some sort of family behaviors and events such as the mean age at first marriage. So this is telling us that there is much more uh, heterogeneity. Let's look at all the, um, all the 18 indicators here. So I have to explain you this graph. This, pro this gives you the 18 indicators on the y-axis all of the 18 indicators that I've listed before, and the HDI is on the x-axis. So each, each of these points provides the association, so it's a coefficient on that regression, the association of the HDI with, it, with each of these indicators. And the markers that are filled refer to estimates that are statistically significant, the ones that are empty refer to non-significant estimates statistically. And also the sort of the area or the width of the marker refers to more precisely estimated associations. So the bigger the marker, the more precisely associated, the, the, the more precisely estimated the association is. Um, also, I think I need to make clear that this indicator before was called TFR, right? But as we are interested in sort of looking at a positive association with HDI, we rephrase some of the indicators to preserve this positive association. So we call this indicator decline in TFR. And this is very consistent with the predictions of the, with theoretical predictions. So this is, called, this is decline in TFR, this is the decline in NRR in general, this proxy is for decline in fertility. And the color refers to the type of indicator that was included in the three axis classification. So the blue ones are the family events and behaviors that are more common in the literature. The orange are the linked lives, so what is intergenerational, intragenerational and intergenerational. And the green one refers to uh, the one that we call life course patterns that take into account some mortality information. And the first... Um, then, commenting on this coefficient, we observe, first of all, that with advances in development, we observe a decline in fertility. And this is nothing but this. We showed you this exactly. There is a, there is a very strong association. Um, this is measured in, uh, this is standardized association. So a one standard deviation increase in the HDI is associated with 0 0.6 increase, little more than 0 0.6 increase, or decline in TFR in this case. And, and we said before that we were interested in comparing the TFR and the NRR because the NRR takes into account mortality. So it takes into account, yes. Um, does this graph show um, the bivariate association? Yes. Or it's, a it's a yeah, it's a bivariate regression uh, clustering uh, standard errors at the country level, but it's a bivariate, a revised coefficient. Yeah, Stand it's, uh, and it's standardized. Yes. So it's one unit increase, in st one standard deviation increase in HDI associated with one standard deviation decline in TFR, uh, 0 0.6 decline in TFR. Do you think that controlling for other factors that might change the size of these 
No, change I don't think so. Probably re re the reduce definitely. But this is all kind of things that we plan to look at in the subsequent. This is just really to provide an overview of different dimensions without accounting for regional controls. Well, actually, we recompute all of this regionally, and you will see this. But we don't account for other regional level variables or country level variables. This is just bivariate, so it's, it's really an association. What I was saying here is that when we look at the, at the net reproduction rate, we observe that there is actually a slightly weaker association with, with the HDI. Uh, it's not that much weaker, and this suggests that the declines in infant mortality have been modest over the period, so there has not been many changes in mortality such that, that these two associations are different. But it still shows that it's important to take into account mortality patterns because this association is 0.1 standard deviation um, smaller, more or less. Then what this graph shows you is that an increase in HDI is associated with um, increases in women's participation in decision making. This is very stable across different domains. So as countries develop further, we observe an increasing trend toward women's empowerment in health, in household purchases, and visits to friends and family. And, um, and also, another finding that, finding that we find interesting is that as um, countries develop further, we observe a delay in the mean age of first sex for women, mean age of first marriage for, for women, and mean age of first birth for women. And actually, even between the three of them, there are some differences. So some react you know, uh, more weakly than others. We knew, we knew that the um, singulate mean age of first marriage uh, was kind of strong because we saw it here. But instead, these three dimensions, recomputed for men, show actually no movement at all. So as countries develop further, there is no uh, association with a delay in single admin age at first marriage for men, single admin age at first sex for men, and so on. And also going to the more interesting um, part of the findings here, when we move to other dimensions, so when we move specifically to other axes of analysis, we observe that there is not much association with the decline in intergenerational co-residence. And this is, again, something that we see here. But also, once we compare, for instance, uh, the decline in marriage prevalence that belongs to the first axis of analysis with the average number of years that an individual who is 15 can expect to live married, which is a new type of indicator that takes into account uh, some mortality information, this association weakens. Actually, it weakens and it becomes statistically not significant. And in general, once we look at this type of, of new indicators that compute marital expectancies or average number of years spent in unions, we observe that there is no association whatsoever with advances in development. So moving to, moving to our regional analysis here, this uh, follows exactly the same logic as the previous graph, but each point here refers to, one, to a region. So this is the association between the HDI and a reduction in TFR for Middle East and North African countries and so on. Each point refers to a region. And again, with this graph, we want to convey the idea that, it, that there is actually pretty, not really infertility in which most regions behave similarly, but there is pretty much regional heterogeneity across, uh, across domains, especially in some domains, such as, for instance, the mean ages are critical life events for men. In some regions, the, the association is even negative, such as Latin America. But this, this is, so we observe sort of regional homogeneity in association between the HDI and fertility, and also somewhat in women's decision making in the domain of health. And instead we observe increasing regional heter heterogeneity in most of other dimensions, but specifically in the timing of, of critical life events, and also in the multigenerational co-residence indicator that I showed you before. So, uh, Overall, this, this, first, this, this paper uh, has showed us that increases in HDI are associated with fertility declines across low and middle income regions. There is very little cross-regional heterogeneity. This is closely followed by, intra by uh, increasing women's empowerment in domains such as health. So if we just stick to these to this, uh, few domains, we could conclude that the prediction of goods of 1963 and these other sort of paradigms that followed closely from goods uh, postulates, we could support the idea of countries moving towards a similar direction. We could support this idea of convergence. However, once we look at other dimensions, and once we look at other dimensions that take into account 
uh, age distribution concerns, differences in, life uh, differences in mortality and life expectancy. These indicators change at a far slower pace and there is considerable regional heterogeneity between them. So this sort of complicates this convergence narrative and points more towards the idea of convergence to diversity. So persistent diversity with advances in development. So we want to really make the point that it's important to move beyond fertility to get a sense of the relative stability of, family, uh, of families in low and middle income countries. I think I mentioned most of this already, but uh, it's important to explore changes in families independently and on top of changes in fertility, because we observe the fertility responsive, but average number of years spent in marriage is unresponsive. And also it's important to look at different axes of analysis, so it's important to look at different indicators belonging to different domains and to take into account for age, different, age uh, distributional concerns across countries and for changes in life expectancies that low and middle income countries have experienced uh, more recently. Probably if we neglected this kind of dimension here for studies of family change in high income societies it wouldn't matter that much because especially in the past 30 years there haven't been um, many changes in life expectancy in high income societies but we're claiming here that this is not the case and it's important to consider. Moving to the policy side and to sort of the SDG side a little bit, going back to the beginning, these findings are very macro level, this was our purpose, but still they suggest some, uh, some policy implications, especially we identified a subset of implications for women whereby higher HDI is conducive to declines in fertility and delays in marriage, this also unfolds along with trends towards gender, more gender equal couple dynamics, so within the households um, couples are becoming more partners within the couple are becoming more balanced in terms of decision making power. Still, we don't know the extent to which higher empowerment within the household then translates into increasing female independence outside of unions and the extent to which there is existing institutional support to enhance female independence by making it possible for women to reconcile family life and labor market opportunities. And as far as implications for child well-being, um, we uh, found that there is kind of evidence of persistence of marriage. We showed this through the person year spent in marriage. And also we showed that there is a, still a positive association between the HDI and the prevalence of two-parent families. It's weak, but still the association is here. So as countries uh, develop, we observe a trend towards more and more two-parent families. That is the idea. So in a sense this points towards maybe not increasing but at least non-declining household stability and enhanced prospects for children well-being. That's it. A little Well, yeah, with the DHS that is not that easy because, as you said, for some countries you may have only two or three points. But for those countries in which that is possible to do, um, most, of, most of the trends that we describe here hold, especially the one for fertility, this clearly holds. For uh, the delay in uh, mean age at first marriage, this clearly holds. For other dimensions, such as the inter and intragenerational, is harder. We don't have enough data points to assess that. But uh, in a sense, that was the challenge we, we undertook with this first idea of pulling countries together. We, we have a version of this paper in which we have many more regional analyses. It's not the one that we ended up submitting, but in case we can show that most of these trends are, are occurring also within most of the regions. Yeah. Is it possible to break out the data by the location of the family? Because people who live in rural areas have a different culture from people. Yeah. 
well, we discussed about this this morning. It's it's part of a, it's it's on our agenda. We want to look specifically within regions and by by area of residence if these trends are similar or different. So it's possible to do it. It's it's definitely possible, um, and and we plan to do it very soon. Yeah. So you really can't conclude if a large portion of the population is in an urban area versus a rural area. You really can't make conclusive uh, summaries unless you break it out because I know for a fact that the culture in the rural areas is totally different from the culture in the urban areas. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree with you, but this is sort of a country level analysis, so that's what country level analysis do in a sense. It's to provide a summary measure between urban and, and rural areas, but we, we are perfectly aware of what you're saying and we plan to address it very soon. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, really quick one. I'm a uh, great presentation, by the way. Um, I'm interested in this relationship between decision making and so as a proxy for women empowerment. And I'm wondering if you're using the measure of like joint decision making or sole decision making um, by the woman as a, a demonstration of increase in women's empowerment. Yeah. So there's a pretty good reason to believe that joint decision making is actually more empowering than sole decision making. Yeah, that is, the, that is the assumption we're making. It's a variable that has four categories. One is husband as the sole decision maker. Mm -hmm. So we code the dummy that way. So and conversely, the joint decision making is for us the the proxy for women's empowerment. Yeah. That's what we're doing. It's the it best we can do with, with the DHS. Yeah. Is it a combination between like sole decision making on the part of the woman and joint, or is it? No. So actually, we're using the husband as the sole decision maker. So mm -hmm. our measure is an inverse measure of women's empowerment. Okay. Then, as we are providing all of these positive associations with HDI, I just rephrased the the name of the indicator. But we're using the husband as the one. So the husband as the decision maker is the one. Just yeah. Well, using like a reduction in the. It's sort of the complement of what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for this presentation. Um, you made the case that um, development um, affects family, family, broadly construed. But now, um, wouldn't we? I that it might work the other way yeah. around, yeah. but what would you say about that? Well, yeah, there is, a, there is definitely a possibility for reverse causality in this kind of macro level analysis. At some point I thought maybe a possibility was to use a lag value of the HDI, which is something we haven't done, but in case, let's see what reviewers say, but we could use a lag value of HDI to sort of account a little bit for this possibility. Still, it's hard when, country le when you do country level analysis. And also development, it's, I don't know, it's probably something that unfolds along so many years that, I don't know, the time, ho the time yes. horizon is, exactly is supportive. Exactly, yeah. because today I have a reduced family size, I can invest more uh, on education, then tomorrow we have higher growth and... Yeah, what, yeah, what totally. what, what? yeah, 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 I perfectly see what you're saying. And we acknowledge all these limitations. I mean, this we never claim causality. We talk about associations. We we just want to show how how different is the association across domains, more than whether the specific association is allows us to claim something causal or or yeah. Yes. So I, I asked this having no expertise in demography. I'm a political scientist, but but you mentioned modernization yeah. theory fairly early on. In yeah. I suspect it figures prominently in what demographers do. Yeah. In my field, it was taken very seriously for much of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then there's been a backlash in the last few decades against modernization theory, specifically the way that we tend to use it. I think as political scientists, that it explains, you know, cross um, cross national variation in political development. Um, but, but what I was specifically curious about is how demographers treat the normative implications of modernization theory, because that's where a lot of critique I've also heard of it comes mm -hmm. in, where it was treated in the post-World War II period as sort of a panacea for all social problems, and that was sort of had problematic implications for colonialism or what have you. Well, I'm curious how demographers today view the normative implications of modernization theory, how much they're critical of it, or whether it's sort of a more complicated story for you. Like, here's well, what your thoughts were. Yeah, well, I don't know if I use this term properly, actually, Frank. Maybe I'm not. You can help me on this. <laughs> it's not my term, either. Yeah. <laughs> 
there's just this idea in demography that the first that it's called first demographic transition theory, and it just postulates that with development, so with the transition from one type of society to another, you move from a regime of high fertility and high mortality to low fertility and low mortality. And many people claim that this is, this ba is based on modernization theory, but it just means like advances in public health, advances in medicine, all the factors that first contributed to, to, to the mortality decline, and then following the mortality decline, the fertility decline uh, reacted as, in, as parents realized the value well, as parents had more surviving children and then were able to realize the value of each surviving children more and then reacted by reducing fertility. That is the idea. I don't know if yeah. there is more to this. Frank, help me. No? But in your study, it sounds like it's really, you're using the term just as sort of a proxy. Or Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Transition. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It doesn't embrace the assumptions, the normative assumptions that we have. Absolutely, because more generations within the household contribute to help each other. So, yeah, that is, that is absolutely. I think this has to do with two points. The first one that goes back to your classification between rural and urban. So, it would be interesting, especially for the indicators that, didn't, that don't change a lot, to get a sort of sub regional classification and look at across different strata of society how that is happening. But also, I think the other point number two relates more to, um, to values, to attitudes and values. And we are planning in, a, in one of extension of this to sort of see how changes in, in dimension, if changes is the, in these dimensions are happening similarly in societies that have specific type of value and attitudes towards the family, the role of the family, the role of intergenerational support, or, or not. So I think until we include these kind of dimensions, it's, it's hard to say. But you're completely right that in most of the regions in which, in which don't see those changes, especially in intergenerational co-residence, is one is Sub-Saharan Africa, is uh, because multiple generations within the household are also an economic way of supporting each other. Yeah. Um, one more question is, uh, since you No, we haven't thought about it. <laughs> Let's first see if we can take it to a journal and then, <laughs> then we can take it to the UN. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's, yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question. Have you considered looking at other variables besides this HDI index, like measures of education, industrialization, urbanization, which might help you understand a little bit more the mechanisms yeah. because that HDI index is kind of Encompassing a lot of different dimensions of life. Yeah, so this is, this is a comment that we got, we got in, in another conference and we thought about it definitely. Actually, our first idea was to, at least at a very minimum for this paper, to, to keep the three separate dimensions of H, the three dimensions of HDI separate so that we could have a sense of where it was mostly education and literacy or health and well being. Mm -hmm. And um, we haven't done it yet because this still for the kind of journal which we plan to send this makes more sense but it's something that we want to do and we will definitely do so an idea could be to just look at those three dimensions another could be to just take another indicator like percentage of female enrolled and whatever yeah i think that could be helpful to unpack more the mechanisms yeah this is about the country coverage in the data as i noticed in the map of countries that had data and didn't um, 
there were countries missing that I expect data just wasn't available, but clearly aren't fully developed. I was thinking, you know, maybe Libya and uh, Western Sahara and others. Yeah. Do you suppose if you were to magically get data from those, would that do you, do you just guess that that would strengthen or lessen some of the associations you're seeing? How do you think that would affect the, your findings? Well, I think the the big problem with this paper here, more than Libya, which is which could affect the estimates, is the lack of China, because. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the low and middle income kind of spectrum, the lack of China is a big missing piece. The thing is that it, it's not available for this kind of service, but we intend to include China through, through other sources. And one of the reasons why we're also collaborating with this team in Spain is because they have access to other types of data that they harmonized already. And our idea is to like merge the four, our strengths to get at the highest possible number of countries. So China is definitely a big missing piece, and we, we state it as a limitation throughout the paper. But also, as, I mean, sort of as we show here, we, we are making the claim that we cover the whole, mostly the whole spectrum of low and middle income countries, so in terms of development. So I think it's the best we can do up to this point. Yeah. yeah. A question was are the other measures that deal with non-money indicators of the state of the family involved in this process? You said non-money? Non a lot of things, a lot of communities, they don't use money. Yeah. So they have a non-money economy. So do you have indicators to deal with that? No. I think with this kind of aggregate analysis, is kind of hard. Yeah. There's really no way to get at that. I think with the data available out there, unless you go specifically into one country and that that country can have some information of those dimensions. But my, my argument would be that I mean, the family interactions within the family are inherently non money ties. So I think you know that's an inherent concept of organizing of the organization of the family. It's non monetized interactions outside there. So even you know, if one were to obtain such an indicator, it's not clear that speaks directly to family change. Family has outside interactions that make money has to not within family interactions and changes there in which you are directly non monetized across the across the world. I was gonna just add because I think underneath a number of your comments is, you know, are we able to get at the explanation of the the causal processes, what's really going on, how this, uh, how family change unfolds under what kinds of circumstances. And that is our aspiration. We've started with this very fundamental analysis to build up to that, but we're going to add stuff to the, at the country level, like the World Values Survey and other uh, uh, material that can help uh, illuminate really um, the, the sort of the, the, the trajectory of changes in these countries and whether in fact they, they work differently, they play out quite differently depending on region or you know cultural area. Um, so I you're catching this at this presentation is really the first product in what will hopefully be uh, you know, five, ten years of data analysis on once we assemble the data sets. Okay. Starting this research project, what was your prior? Starting it was really to take what extent data, extent data we could pull together because in fact we, there's never been a, a global database that has addressed this question. And I think part of the, the endeavor here is to build such a database that will keep um, getting more complex. Yeah. I guess related to this, I think you know, there's some family research that's driven by people who have visions on what family change is good or bad from their point. And that is not, uh, in some ways, we saw 
we approach this as empirical science, but you know, we really don't know how these families are transforming across the world and want to document this and theorize about them and a bunch of things without necessarily, at least not in our role as scholars, having any view is any of that good or bad from, you know, from a broader perspective. You say that's really important for a bunch of perspectives that will be key, but it shall well be. So for a whole bunch of things we but uh, there's a wide consensus. We want to maximize child well-being and the family, understanding family change is important to that. And we want to document this. And you know, we per se have no opinion, at least in our roles as scholar, but maybe even outside of that, of whether an increase in cohabitation is good or bad from you know, from other perspectives or not. And certainly there's some family research out there, including on some sort of patterns that is much more driven by, you know, an agenda that has some changes good and some is bad in quotation, in quotation marks, and we are not in that. Um, I need to break up the conversation, but it is 1.30, and I know a lot of people have other commitments. Um, please join me in thanking <laughs> Thank you.